Okay, so this is about a six point extension of the gathered fragment. And uh, it is inspired by the mucaculus. So the mucaculus uh, is a very, a very pleasant logic for uh, um, well, logicians. It's um, like an assembly language if you want to work with transition systems or with directed graphs. I mean, you can translate uh, all specification languages uh, into it. And unlike uh, some of the specification languages, it has um, reasonable model theoretic properties. So what the calculus does is start set out with a very simple logic, so basic model logic, that, uh, that means propositional logic plus the ability to quantify over successors of a current state. So it's a very, very restricted quantification pattern. And um, then add fixed point constructs which are useful if we want to, to write formula the way we would write programs. So what we can do is we have a notation for loops of this kind, like start with the empty set, and then apply an operator until nothing happens anymore, and then stop, return the value. And OK, the alternative is to start with the whole universe and apply the operator until nothing more happens. And so we have a very weak local logic that talks about, uh, about what happens to the current state and about the immediate successors. And then we have this simple recursion mechanism that lets us uh, move local assertions along passes, essentially. And that explains why uh, it, is, it, it, it can be interesting for verification, because in verification, we are very interested in, in executions. And uh, this is what the calculus can do well. I mean, it can run, run along executions and uh, describe how local properties evolve. And it has also the branching ability that the mu calculus has. So, the, uh, sorry, the model logic has. And um, there's something about this branching ability that to which we will come. So, first, if we look at uh, the mu calculus abstractly, is it, it is a, uh, a very friendly logic as it has a tree model property. So we have a, whenever a formula is satisfiable, we, we can find it satisfied in a tree. And also, it has finite model property. And then um, you can reprove uh, preservation theorems I mean, that show that things that, I mean, syntax and semantics are in a healthy relation and uh, interpolation and so on. And also, it is algorithmically friendly. So we are uh, quite close to P for the evaluation of the calculus formula. So actually, we are in a class in which the parity, uh, the um, primes were before NP and co NP. And uh, this gives us hopes to, that one day it will be shown to be in P. At the moment, it is not known yet. And satisfiability is next prime. OK, and then well, it, it is somehow maximal in what we could expect to have as a friendly logic. And uh, this maximality has to do with bisimulation invariance. So bisimulation uh, is, a, is logical equivalence for model logic. And uh, it means behavioral equivalence for, for systems. We, can, um, we will talk about different bisimulation relations later on. But I mean, as long as we don't want to distinguish bisimilar models, Model logic is as strong as first order. This was a very interesting uh, characterization by Van Bentham and Andre Kahnemetti. And, uh, and the calculus is the bisimulation fragment, I mean, the, um, of monadic second order logic. So it is like the lifting of model logic to a second order. And um, well, the key to, to most of the proofs that are relevant here, or have been relevant for the mucaculus, are that we have this bisimulation relation 
that allows us to manipulate models. So instead of working with arbitrary complicated models, we can also we can always massage things into trees. And then we can let automata run and then we get whatever we like usually. Automata very nicely behaved. And well, the ambition is to, to have a logic that is equally friendly but does not is not uh, restricted to to talk about executions. I mean not to about about transitions in, in graphs or and only forward moving uh, things, but um, well, it should be able to speak about databases, and it should be uh, so. It should be able to talk about hierarchies and not uh, have a notion of direction. And well, we can see how far we get. So, the idea for the model for for the gadget fragment is that to to take the model fragment and replace these guards which tell, look at successors with new, more general guards that say, okay, new, new, look at new variables that are linked to those who, in which we are free, I mean, to, to our currently uh, uh, free lab variables um, in, in a simple way. Okay. This is the, just the point that I think. So, we will look at uh, a very basic, well, the, I mean the basic guarded fragment, where these relativization guards are, uh, are atomic formula. So we have the relations from the vocabulary, and we have equality and nothing else. And uh, then to, to make some efforts, I mean, to explain why we do some efforts, we will talk about uh, a bit more, I mean, a more general fragment. And there, so the guards, so this formula that tell us how the newly quantified variables should re relate to the old ones, um, they talk about a generalization of being an atom. And being an atom, I mean, if we forget about arities, and so if we just, lo just look at the underlying structure of a, of a relational structure. So, I mean, the Geffman graph of a relational structure what does it do to a tuple that is, uh, that is in a relation? It makes a click out of it. Yes. And here we say we can, because I mean, a relation relates every two elements uh, in its entry. Now, we, we allow quantification over any members of a click. And uh, one consequence is of this is that as long as we are in the basic guarded fragment, so every time we quantify over new variables, they have to, to be connected through a relation. So we can never talk about more variables than our signature, our vocabulary is large. I mean, if our maximal arity is three, we can never talk about four variables that are alive at the same time. Okay, we can use equality, but it doesn't really help. So um, this is a, I mean, we can get rid of this, of this um, restriction by looking at this Geifman uh, sense of guarding. And there we can have formula that are, I mean, that have sub-formula with arbitrarily many free variables. So that's, that's one of the reasons. Yeah. We don't want, I mean, complexity results that are good because the weights are bounded by definition. Uh, that's a great condition that we can get that uh, the, the the elements that satisfy alpha with respect to z from the click? Yes. I mean, we can write it. Yeah. We know how the relations are called. So we can say that every two members in this, uh, in this um, uh, tuple, they are related in some way. So we will, we will quantify over the remaining members and we'll say, OK, these are, I mean, they are part of a relation. So you see, for example, if we have ternary relations, so, well, I draw them. So say I, I relate to these three things, with an R and these three things, and these three things. Now, uh, I mean, a priori, these three, they would not be, or I mean, all the four, yeah. they, they are not guarded in the strict sense. But they are guarded in the, the Geifman sense. 
So I, I can write a, a little formula that expresses that um, that I, I'm talking about four elements which are in this configuration. Is it? Hey. Yeah. I mean, syntactically, it's this. It is a formula that guesses whatever is needed to complete the tuples. And semantically, it is in the moment I have a valuation and I try to relate the subformula, I have to make sure that uh, well, the, the variables are allocated to something that's forms a click. So now we go to a logic that is stronger than the calculus and we can then uh, first order logic plus fixed point. So we extend this guarded fragment with, with uh, least fixed point construct. And then we have the dual greatest fixed point construct. So the least fixed point you have seen already today, no? and uh, Anush and uh, Jam. And the greatest fixed point, uh, I don't know. well, it's just uh, the dual uh, notion. And uh, well, I mean, what we are sure immediately that we can do is we can talk about the mu calculus by referring to backwards modalities. So instead of saying I have a successor with certain properties, I say, can say I have a predecessor. Or I can talk about uh, edges that form a loop or but then, on the other hand, I can also speak about database, I mean, about, uh, about higher, topless of higher arity. Okay. And, well, I will try to put together some tools so that uh, it, I mean, we have everything that we used to have for mu calculus kind of uh, logics to do satisfiability. And then show you that actually these tools are not enough, and then maybe you. I mean, then, then we have a better insight on, on uh, why the, this, this logic is a bit more than just a calculus. OK, that's my intention. So I mean, a priori, we want to look at uh, questions of, I mean, OK, we have a formula. We have a structure. We want to know whether the formula is true on the structure. And then uh, we have two structures. We want to know whether there exists any formula that can distinguish them. And then we have only a formula. We have no structure. And we want to know whether there exists a model or even less. So we have a formula, and we want to know whether there exists a finite model. So let's see how we approach these things with, I mean, knowing less and less about the structure. So if we know all about the structure, then it's about uh, model checking. And here, oh, sorry. So this is the problem. Yes, we, we want to know, we, we just want to evaluate um, guarded fixed point formula. This is not, I mean, there is nothing very deep uh, to this point. Okay, so no, a priori, I would just take uh, relations from the initial vocabulary as cards. Okay, so, um, so there will be some games that come in over and over again, and uh, Jam already made fun of me in saying that I'm I will probably talk about games and so, but I will not. It's about automata. So the underlying um, tool for, for doing um, model checking and also, I mean, to, to build up the automata later on are, are parity games. And um, so if we forget about the logics, these are quite simple games. We have two players, and they form an infinite path. So they are parity games are described by a graph. Is there anybody who has not seen? I mean, um, do I need to explain parity games? OK. Yes? OK. So this is the description. We have a directed graph. And then some of the no nodes are marked as belonging to one of the players. And then we have a, a labeling with of, of nodes with numbers. And uh, for this labeling, it's important that it has finite range. Otherwise, I would not, uh, I mean, I would not expect that this graph is finite. So it can be an infinite graph, but uh, I want this priority labeling to talk only about finitely many numbers. And then you c we can, so um, to play on such a, on such a graph, what happens is that we start at a given position. So this is a constant of the description. And then the two players form a path. 
this goes like is that if the current, I mean, if we are at a node that is marked to belong to well, player Alois, then she chooses the successor. And uh, if it is uh, not her node, then it is Abelard who chooses the successor. And this way, we continue a path. Now, it can happen that um, a player gets stuck, and then he has lost. And the game is, I mean, the play is over. And well, these are the clear cases. But it can happen that we have, we have an infinite uh, uh, way through the path. And then we look at the priorities that, were on the, that we met. And um, since the range is finite, we have seen infinite many nodes, then there must be some priority. I mean, there must be several priorities that appear infinitely often. But we look at the lowest one. And that needs to be even. So it's a, this, this may be a bit strange. But the point is we want to. Um, I mean, apparently we want to talk about things that happen over and over and again. And then we want to, to talk about them in a, in a nested way. So we want to, to just n not just talk about things that happen over and over again, but uh, we want to have some degree of freedom there. OK. And um, in such kind of games, I mean, a strategy okay, for one of the players would be uh, a function that tells for a given prefix how to continue. And here we are talking mostly about memoryless strategies. These are strategies, I mean, they are functions that just tell you at one node which successor to choose. So with a memoryless strategy, you can also play. You may not be able to win. You can follow this. So uh, following a strategy means uh, well, whenever you are asked to move, then you look at your prefix or at your current node, and you apply your strategy to choose your successor. And the winning strategy is one that guarantees that you will win everything, uh, I mean, all the plays, if you follow it. And uh, so if we, if we think in terms of graph and of, I mean, so we said a game is, is just a graph, and a memoryless winning strategy would be for the positions that belong to allies a selection of nodes or, or of, of successors, or just a selection of one outgoing edge. Yeah. So Alois has a winning strategy in a graph if she can select from each of her position one edge and throw the others away. And then to win means that every cycle that is formed in the remaining gra graph has a, an even minimum. And now for, for the other player, it means that I mean he can choose one successor from every node that belongs to him. and then every cycle has a, an odd minimum. And a priori, it's not so obvious no? that uh, either you can choose, I mean, from half of the nodes, you can choose a successor so that all the cycles are odd. Or you can choose for the other half some successors so that all the cycles are, are even. It's quite subtle. And well, this is the, the theorem that helps a lot. Uh, for automata, that uh, in a parity game, it is indeed the case that you, I mean, you are in one of these two situations. Either Alois can choose one successor that makes all the cycles even, or Abelard can choose a successor so that all the cycles are odd. And um, well, then the algorithms of parity game are I mean, so easy to understand, uh, not easy to, I mean, to up to the point to which we know them. Uh, if you have only one player, it is uh, not very difficult to see that. Uh, I mean, it's in p time to tell who is. The, I mean, whether he wins or not. And it means if you have a graph to tell whether all the cycles are are, are even or not. No, that's not difficult. And um, so, if we go to the two-player version, then it's about guessing. I mean, if you guess the strategy, then you can tell whether it's a winning one. So this gives you an NP thing, NP algorithm, and uh, you can do it for the other player, then it's a coin P, so we are NP, coin P. And um, the deterministic algorithms, they usually have the number of priorities in the exponent. But so there is a very interesting algorithm. If I had a huge amount of time, I would tell you a bit about it. So um, there is a, an algorithm that is really easy to understand. It, it builds kind of a, a potential. Uh, for the for the positions of the game, yes. and um, so the idea is that uh, if you have um, so uh, the, this potential is an encoding of a winning strategy. So it's something atomic. It's it's it, it, you assign a, a value to every node, and um, it's so 
whenever you you go lower, I mean, you look at the neighbors and you you go to you find a neighbor that has a lower potential, and you can take it, and this will guarantee finally that you that you win something like this. And um, so, a quite simple algorithm shows that uh, if you start with potentials, I mean, a vector of potentials that is about half the priorities. So this this is why we have this d half. Then, uh, well, I mean, this is enough to put in the exponent, and in the for the remainder we are, um, well, I mean, we have the the number of nodes in the basis. So and that determines the complexity. Okay. Now, um, so model checking for for uh, for gather fixed point logics is is exactly parity games. So, um, so, um, so what we do is we take the first order evaluation game a la Hintika, and then we we do something about the fixed points. So, uh, for the first order part. There will be no secrets, and uh, the fixed point, they do exactly what the priorities are responsible. Okay, so what is this? I mean, morally, this game is a product between the formula and the structure. So the formula, you can think of the, of the syntax tree. Okay, it's not really a tree. It has some loops because we do, I mean, because of the fixed point variables, but think of the syntax tree, and then you have the structure. So the positions in the game are an, a pointer to place in the formula, pointer to a place in the structure. And uh, we start in the, with the entire formula, and we point to well, no particular place in the structure because the entire formula doesn't have, uh, I mean, we, we talk about sentences with no free variables. And then the moves, they are designed in such a way that if a formula is true, with uh, the free variables bound to the pointers to the structure, then Alois should be able to keep it true. And if it's false, then Abelard should be able to keep it false. So this uh, means that uh, disjunctions and uh, existential quantifiers are removed, uh, like as in the Hintika games, uh, fixed point variables are just regenerated and we end in the atom. So this is the <coughs> what happens in detail. Um, so. Okay, yeah, this is not surprising. Yeah, we want to, so say we talk about Alois, she wants to prove that the disjunction is true and has a certain valuation. But, well, then she will choose one of the two members of the disjunction and will, ha will need to stay with the same uh, valuation. So this is what happens in a disjunction step, and conjunction is dual. Then for the quantifiers, we say Alois should prove that there is a witness Y that is uh, tightened with regard alpha to the open variables and then makes phi true. And we have, so the current valuation is, is beta. Uh, so what we will do, I mean, what possible successors are, the formula will certainly be phi that we need to prove, but then the valuations. So there, we will choose valuations that satisfy the guard, and this means guard in whatever sense. And they do, I mean, it's, uh, the new valuation should agree with the current one on the variables that uh, that I mean, on the, on the, and that are kept. You know, so we have new variables that are bound now, and then the x variables they they are kept. So they should not uh, be changed by this transition. Yeah. So it should be quite natural thing. But what is important is that, well, whenever we choose uh, something new from the structure, we move from a guarded tuple to something which is again guarded. I mean, we never move away from some from from guarded spots. And okay, the rest is. Uh, a trivial for the game. I mean, we fixed point vari variables are regenerated with their definitions, and when we meet an atom, then we can locally check because we have evaluation. We have a formula who is winning. Okay, and so we have to to monitor what happens with these fixed point re regenerations, and there the idea is that uh, um, so the outermost variable uh, that is regenerated or the, the definition that is regenerated infinitely often should be should be um, a greatest uh, variable to make uh, alloys win and then we distribute as many priorities as there are 
real alternations between greatest and least fixed point uh, variables to, to make this happen. So we have to take care uh, that least fixed point variables get uh, bad priorities for alloys and uh, greatest fixed point good ones, and um, that the dependencies are reflected in the significance of, of priorities. Okay, so in the end we will give as many, I mean, we'll distribute as many priorities as there are real alternations of fixed point variables. Um, okay, and now, <coughs> well, it turns out that this is alternative semantic for truth of uh, guarded fixed point formula in, in, in structures. And the proof is, um, I mean, well, I mean, the, the, the important part of the proof is what you do with the fixed points. And um, there is a very nice correspondence there. You can take a fixed point formula and unravel them syntactically and count how many times you have unraveled them until they become true. I mean, since you have a stru your structure, if the formula is true, it will, I mean, by, by progressively coming, uh, embedding it into an infinitary variant of... Uh, of the model logic, you will find um, a true statement. So you find a you find a true approximant, and this approximant, I mean, you you do this for every uh, say every least fixed point variable. You you calculate the approximant at which it becomes true, and they give exactly the progress measure. So this gives us immediately a proof that uh, that if a formula is true, then we can uh, we have a winning strategy to to win this game. So if the formula is true, then we win the game, and the, the other way around as well. And this does not depend on, on having finite structures. So we can, all we need is uh, finitely many priorities. So finite formula. Okay. Um, well, the story is more, I mean, what is most important in this part is that, I mean, we have the, so this is our syntax tree of the formula. And we have these junctions and conjunctions, and sometimes we regenerate a variable. So it goes to its definition. And there they are, these regenerations, they are somehow um, nested, and we are interested about what is regenerated infinitely often. But I mean, this is, happens on the, on the formula side, and then on the structure side, whenever we talk as a subformula, we talk about a spot, so something which is, uh, well, at least click guarded. Yeah? I mean, if it is uh, normally guarded. So something very, very dense and very local in the structure. And when we move to another formula, because say if this was an existential quantifier, then we go to another guarded structure. So the elements of the structure uh, about which we talk, they are somehow close together all the time. And this we will need to use. Okay, for the rest, we can use the game to <coughs> tell uh, um, what is the complexity of model checking. And actually, the complexity of model checking is quite close to, to, I mean, it's much closer to model logic than to first order in general. Uh, okay, so let me see. No, to, to me calculus than to least fixed point logic. So the same, the games don't become very big, especially in the case of strong, st uh, of strict guards. Then we have only, I mean, what we are interested in the structure, there are only entries in the relation tables. And entries in the relation tables, they must appear in the description of the structure. So you're, you're, I mean, the size of the game is linear in the size of the description of your input structure. And okay, this determines the space that you need to, to solve the game, but uh, the complexity is still quite good. So this is the space complexity, and where well, the time complexity is just bothered by this alternation depth. Then when we have a uh, click, uh, ah, maybe I have it somehow. So with click guards, it's a bit more difficult. Ah, yeah, here, sorry. To, to tell that they are, um, they give us some advantage in complexity. But, well, I mean, if you know a bit about tree width, yeah, so, uh, we, we have to, so these spots in the structure in the case of click guardedness are, are clicks in the Geifman graph. So um, 
The question is how many clicks can we have in the Geifman graph? And what happens is that clicks, I mean big clicks, make the tree width very high. So one way to parameterize the complexity here is to say, to look at the tree width. If the tree width is small, the clicks cannot be big. So this gives you a bound on the, spa on the, on the size of the game. Especially, I mean, games that are somehow close to looking like uh, trees, they, they will be small. And also structures will give small games. Okay, uh, now we have model checking complexity. But so um, in the case of mu calculus and well, I mean the traditional approach of, of doing satisfiability with, with um, automata is that you design, I mean, you, you come up with a model checking automaton, I mean, an automaton that you can feed in an input structure and it tells you whether it's a model or not, and then you try to, to do some emptiness test. I mean, of course, you have to, to have the correct codings of the structure, but well, this can come. So now it's a matter of the, car, of the coding. We, we know the model checking game, and we will be able to make an automaton that does the, the formula part, that reflects the formula part of our guarded, uh, well, of, the, of our model checking problem, so that guesses the part of the structure. But uh, the question is how to massage the structure so that we will get something that the automata can eat. And uh, so the, the main tool is, is the guarded variant of bisimulation. And we, we can think of it, I mean, the easiest way to think of it is as an Ehrenfeucht-Fresse game. It goes just like the first order Ehrenfeucht-Fresse game. The only thing is that you are uh, the spoiler is restricted to, to put his pebbles on guarded tuples. So he can never put, uh, yeah, if he, let's say, I mean, he cannot put his third tuple in a position that is not connected to the other two. So he always has to live on islands. And, uh, well, that's it. I mean, if, since the, the spoiler has this restriction, then the duplicator must, of course, also stay on guarded tuples. And if you, if you have two structures on which duplicator would win the Ehrenfeucht-Fresse game in this case, then uh, for any formula, you could also see that the model checking would work in the same way on the two structures. So, I mean, this game would guarantee that uh, the evaluation games don't distinguish uh, the structures for any formula. So, guarded bisimulation, as defined here, is, um, I mean, guarded logics are invariant under this time of bisimulation. And, well, you can also do it. I don't know whether we'll need it today. So, you can view it as a system of partial isomorphisms that you can uh, extend back and forth. Uh, okay, that's, that's very important. But um, yeah, let's see. I will come back. So there is one very, very nice idea here. Um, so the idea to to encode of a structure everything that we will need to know while playing the Ehrenfeucht-Fresse game on this structure, but. That's a bit weird, no? Because you play Ernst Fresse game on two structures, but look what I mean. What this um, structure encodes? So we take, well, we take a, a first order structure here, with horrible arities and so, on, and then we construct a graph, and we label this graph uh, with the guarded tuples, and then, okay. So we we associate, we take a node for every guarded tuple, and we make individual elements for this for these tuples in our new graph. So here will be an element, and here will be. And then we label them with the shape, I mean, well, with the structure that we copy. I mean, we copy the structure as a label to this graph, and then we link uh, two nodes with an edge that tells which part of the, I mean, of the label from here overlaps with the label from here. This is something we will use quite often. So it's a way to, I mean, this, this, um, this graph 
tells us how the, the, the guarded tuples are arranged in our original structure. And now it turns out that, I mean, if you have two games, um, I mean, an Ehrenfurcht-Fresse game between two structures, and if you take their, uh, their game graphs, I mean, the graphs constructed in, in this way, then you have guarded dissimulation between the complicated structures, if and only if you have traditional uh, model B simulation between the, um, between the game graphs. And uh, so this will be useful in a while because uh, okay, so once we have a traditional graph representation of um, of our, I mean, it's not really our structure. It's not the graded structure. It's only the representation of the ehrenfurcht fresse game on this structure, this, this uh, graded simulation graph. But, um, well, it, it, it carries a lot of information about this structure. So, well, whenever we have a gra graph and we want to do automata, we are, we are tempted to unravel it. So the data structure with which we will work are the composition trees, and they... So they look, I mean, there are particular class, um, kinds of, of graphs, of, of game graphs, uh, guarded B simulation game graphs. So their, uh, their nodes are labeled with little structures of, of small size, of a bounded size. So this we fix in the beginning. Okay. Yeah. So I describe a data structure. Maybe we can forget for a moment why it is good. So we take a, a vocabulary and we take a width. And then we create trees that have little structures, I mean structures that have not more elements than, than this width, and talk about this vocabulary. So we populate a tree with such a structure. And then, well, um, so what we wrote on the, on the nodes of the tree we will call bags, and uh, what is written on the edges this we will call overlap. Okay, and we'll, ask one condition, namely that if you have two neighboring nodes and the edge label speaks about an overlap, then, uh, I mean, the, the induced structure at the ends of the edge should be re really overlapping, so there should be no conflict between neighbors if uh, on overlapping parts. Okay, and this is a generalization of the standard tree decomposition. So the standard tree decomposition I mean, if you take a graph and you find the tree decomposition, okay, you will find, you will need to, to be sure that uh, it fits into this width so that uh, these small structures are enough to carry all the information, but you will get a tree that you can view in this way, so with bags and overlaps. I mean, uh, typically, people would maybe draw a tree and write on every edge uh, which elements of the structure uh, are allocated to this node, but we don't want to, to carry the structure with us. So the target is one day to, to get rid of structures and to, to guess structures and to go compose them. Okay, and the other thing that we can do is to take a discarded dissimulation game graph that we get from the ernst game and then to unravel it. Then we have a tree. Also, decomposition tree. We will see what it is good for. Well, once you have such a decomposition tree, I mean, from the tree decomposition of a, of a structure, we can rebuild a structure. So we can do something similar um, with a decomposition, well, with the trees that we get by unraveling the, the game description. Uh, okay, so the re recovering process is just undoing, I mean, interpreting what this overlap should mean. Uh, maybe it's a bit more complex than what is written here. So what we say is that, for example, if we have two nodes and they say that we are sharing, well, the first element, or so the first and the third element, and then we have another node and says here, I'm still talking about the same first element. And here, this guy is still talking about the same first element, but he shares the tree with this one, but here the tree was not shared. So um, it means that I mean, in this path, or maybe there's another. So this part of the tree all, all speaks about one element, and we contract this part. 
Um, okay, and we do this with all the elements. And then we have to see how, so this gives us the individual elements. It's just contraction of every, every neighborhood that declares its, itself as being an overlapping copy of an element. And then we have to see uh, what we do with the relations, but that is quite easy because, I mean, since we have this overlap consistency condition, it means that um, the story about an element is told in a subtree. And so if we have several elements, then the intersection of the subtrees that talk about them, it will still be a tree. So in this, in this tree, we will find a, the description of what happens to all these elements together. Okay, so this is very much like what happens in, uh, in, in tree decomposition. And, um, well, what we, what we get here is, so if we take the game graph and unravel it, in such a way, and then reconstruct something, I mean, reconstruct a structure, then we get something dissimilar to the structure with which we started. We will not get exactly the same, but something dissimilar. And that is a tree, I mean, that's the, the tree model property. It says that every, every formula that can be satisfied has a model that can be represented as a tree with, with small width. I mean, the width is the one that we get in the formula. I mean, this is the, yeah, the formula tells us how big the clicks, the, 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 guard, the, the guarded tuples are, and what which we can speak. The guarded tuples are the ones that the Ehrenfurcht for say game cares for, and we unravel this game graph, and then we get uh, the composition. So here is the way it looks. Aha, okay. Um, pardon me? Uh, so we, we fix, I mean, we take. Yeah, it's, it's defined for a fixed K. Yeah, yeah. So every formula of a certain width will have a decomposition tree of this width, but I mean, usually it will be infinite. And I mean, worse so, what we get from the, from the game is something very rich, very redundant. I mean, uh, yeah. Here I, oh, I tried to draw something which was already much less redundant. But the point is, I mean, if we just record this information that we need to in the Ehrenfurt Fresse game, so we will have, I mean, for example, Every guarded tuple to which you're not related will appear at, I mean, as, as your neighbor at every level. So you, you will have, um, I mean, all, all the guarded tuples are, are your neighbors. And you don't really want, uh, I mean, if we, if we hope to, to make a satisfaction algorithm that, that has to, to work with such kind of trees, we are lost. And these are, I mean, we'll never be able to tell whether a uh, tree decomposition stems from uh, the direct unraveling of an uh, So, the, the, but what we can be here more relaxed and to say we are, so we, we call a decomposition of a structure, any, any tree of this shape, I mean of this decomposition shape, that if you recompose it, gives you something guarded dissimilar to your original structure. So we, we talk about decompositions up to guarded dissimulation and this is, here, a candidate for a decomposition. It's a pity that. So here, this was a structure, and we did a decomposition of width three. I mean, well, so we took a neighborhood, and then we told how it relates to his, its neighborhoods, and then how it relates to its neighborhoods. And then, I mean, well, we, it never stops, because uh, with width three, yes, we have here uh, I mean, we have four clicks, so I mean, of course, we will always generate new, um, new guarded neighbors. Yeah? But it is already a decomposition that is uh, smaller than uh, what we would get if we would take just a game. Yeah. But okay, you cannot see it, so I will try to. Okay, and if we take this structure and recompose it, we get something like this. So this was the decomposition, and we would get something. I mean. For the, for the guarded fragment, this and this is, is the same with fixed part. Uh, so we're fine, and we have a tree decomposition. So we're set, or we're close to something that will help us with uh, satisfiability. Uh, maybe I quickly tell why we're not ready, and then suggest what we also would, I mean, so why are we not happy yet? Uh, 
Yeah. So the idea is, well, we knew how to do the game. We know how to do an automaton that tells whether uh, the composition tree is a model or not. I mean, well, of a formula. And such a decomposition tree, uh, sorry. I mean, what we need is to, to write an automaton that reads such kind of trees and tells us whether in the formula that we would get if we would recompose it, um, no, sorry, in the structure that we get if we would recompose it, we, the formula would be true. Yeah? Then we know something about our, our original structure. So, so um, well, the problem is we cannot expect to to have a full description of, uh, of the neighborhood of a guarded tuple immediately available. So we will need to run through the tree to collect our description. We have two choices here. Either we say everything's there, but then we have to check that our input is consistent and this is too complicated, or we have to run through the tree to collect all the data that we need locally. So here the choice will be to, to go away from one-way automata and I mean to use two-way automata that I mean, have the ability to climb around uh, in trees and collect the uh, information about neighbors. And well, the second problem is that we don't get a finite model. So we get something which is ostentatively infinite. And uh, well, I mean, here many people have been working several years, me too, and I didn't find, I mean, I didn't manage to solve it, but um, Vince Barani and Georg Gottlob and Martin Otto, they, they came up with a magic theorem last year at Lix. And they say, uh, if you take like, well, to make it short, we take a, a small representation of, of the Ernst Fritz Fresse game uh, um, digest that we, I mean, this uh, guarded with simulation game graph. So we, we factorize it under by simulation. We don't care about uh, the similar copies. So we take this thing and we call it the, the invariant of a structure. And it turns out that if you give me something that looks like the finite invariant of something that I don't know, I mean, you just give me something and tell me it's a finite invariant, then there is an algorithm that builds a structure that will really have this invariant. And the good thing is if the, I mean, the invariant is finite, then the structure is also finite. And we can, I mean, we can also build it in polynomial time. And that's something uh, that, uh, well, that is very relevant for, uh, well, the descriptive complexity of the guarded fragment. It helps us to, to do finite satisf satisfiability um, for, the, for the, I mean, once we have done the satisfiability, knowing this, we are almost done for finite satisfiability in uh, guarded fixed point logic. So that's it. Thank you.